give it just a few minutes to let people get connected. We're not very many people on right now, so give it just a minute. <clears throat> Oh, excuse me if I'm going to take a sip of coffee. It's been a lengthy day and I'm trying to stay pepped up. Just say, <clears throat> excuse me, I got, took a sip of coffee and it went down the wrong, wrong way, I think. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to welcome everyone. It's Thursday night at uh, about 7.05 and April the 15th. I hope you've all had a good day and um it seems like to me that we are getting slowly back to normal with this um and hopefully we're uh getting in the <clears throat> latter part of this pandemic and uh so we're praying that <clears throat> for that uh, to continue um <clears throat> I'm trying to wait just a little while, let a few more people get on before I start our Bible study. I was talking to uh, one of the brothers in the church today and I was just explaining how important it is to have a knowledge of the Word of God and how that Hebrew children <clears throat> under Moses' law, uh, there were frontlets made for their eyes. They, they, uh, <clears throat> uh, they had memorizations. Uh, they were trained up to know the word of God and, rem and, and know uh, and be able to memorize it and know, know it by heart understand uh, all of the law and all the aspects of it, the history <coughs> uh, of Israel <coughs> and uh, in our society, it's been very difficult to get people uh, really trained up to know the Word of God. That's why I'm, I'm really am putting a strong emphasis on us reading our Bible through this year. Um, and uh, I'm also encouraging people to find somebody if you're if you're if you're married, you spouses read it together every day that you can. <clears throat> if you'll always try to read like two days reading at one time, you'll you'll make it because you're gonna have days that things happen you can't read and and uh, you know, what, like my wife and I never read on Sundays. Our day's just so full. Excuse me for my sniffles, but it's just that time of year and I have allergies, so I just have to suffer through it. So if you would forgive me. Um, um, anyway, <clears throat> the word of God is just so important. And I'm encouraging all the local people here to read it, uh, the King James Version, in chronological order. Get a chronological reading plan. It's so, it help you so much better to understand the Bible as it unfolds. <clears throat> you know, the reason that it's, you know, the reason that the Bible is assorted in categories, <clears throat> the Old Testament, 
It starts out with the five books of Moses called the Torah. And then <clears throat> uh, the historical books is behind that, being those books of Joshua, <clears throat> Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, those 12 historical books. And then the categories of the of the poetic books, which is Job and Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes and Songs of Solomon. <clears throat> Those five poetic books. And then you have the four major prophets that are categorized, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and um, <clears throat> Ezekiel and Daniel, excuse me, five of them. And then the 12 minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, uh, <clears throat> Amos, Obadiah, uh, Jonah, uh, Micah, Nahum, uh, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those are the minor prophets. <clears throat> I'll tell you how I remember those. It was hard for me to memorize those. But I made up a little saying, and here it is. And the first letter of the, each of these sayings is the book. Having Jesus and only Jesus manifested. Next, having Zion, having Zion manifested. So see, having Jesus and only Jesus. Habakkuk, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, Hosea, Joel, uh, Amos, uh, <clears throat> Jonah, only Jesus, Micah, manifested. Next, Nahum. Uh, next, uh, let's see, Nahum, having Habakkuk, <clears throat> Zion, Zephaniah, having Haggai, Zion, Zechariah, and Malachi. So, uh, uh, I just, you know, just a little saying may help you if you can incorporate that. Well, you're more than welcome to it. Anyway, <clears throat> that's the, it's put together in categories because that helps you to be able to find the books. Like someone tells you, go to Psalms 114. Well, you just go to the book of Psalms. There are all 150 chapters listed there and you can find it. But if you try to do that in a chronological Bible, you know, like the 75th Psalm, for an example, is one of David's Psalms, and you're going to find that in Second. You're going to find that incorporated in Second Samuel and <clears throat> Chronicles, First Chronicles. And so um, it'd be hard to find if it was all mixed up like that as far as the indexing was concerned. So that's why it was put together in categories. But if you read it in chronological order, you know, when you're reading Moses' books, where Moses wrote a few Psalms, his Psalms will be right there, fitted in at the time that he wrote the Psalm with the history or whatever he's talking about. Same thing with David. It'll be the same thing with uh, uh, Solomon. Uh, Proverbs in, in, will be in with the, the writings of the Kings and Chronicles where Solomon, Solomon served. And then your king, your prophets will be in it, during the historical period of the kings that are laid out, uh, the story of the kings. And so it helps you, like right now, if I told you what was the book of, you know, who was the king that Habakkuk served under? Was it Israel or Judah? Or, you, it's difficult for you to remember all of that where, but when you're reading it, if you read it in chronological order, it's gonna fit better and you're gonna get a better understanding of how that fits. Because if you just read the prophet, you may not know. It tells you what king uh, was reigning at the time and whether or not he was a prophet in Israel or Judah normally, but uh, retain that in your mind and remember what that king did is altogether different than remembering uh, how you read it. So I encourage you to re get a chronological reading plan. You can do it on the app. You know, I recommend the Olive Tree Bible app. 
on your phone. It's a it's a tremendous tool. In fact, <clears throat> you know that's that's where everything's going. You got to stay up just about. I about quit using my physical leather bound paper back Bible. Uh, not paper back, but paper written uh, <clears throat> Bible. I pretty well use my iPad as my Bible today. And I'm talking to you right now off of my computer in my office. And half of my computer is uh, the this broadcast screen on Facebook. And the other half is my Olive Tree Bible on on my PC. So anyway, most people are on here by now. And I, I've talked about this more than once. And God gave me this years ago. Um, but I'm going to explain it to you. Uh, I'm going to try to get it explained within what, uh, you know, within the, by the, by eight o'clock central standard time. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to try to make, be a little more thorough than the way I've explained it at times. It's in the second, it's in second Peter in the first chapter. And I'll call it the seven steps of perfection. And, <clears throat> you know, the question is going to be, what step are you on? How, how many steps have you taken on your journey to perfection. Perfection being <clears throat> maturity in God, spiritual maturity, where you have overcome the sins of the flesh, the Adamic nature, and I'll say something about that. Adam was born of God, and he was, God made him a, a, a full grown adult. And God gave him a mind that had that was filled with knowledge and even wisdom. Uh, God can do that, you know. <laughs> uh, Adam didn't have to go through all the experiences to get everything he had in knowledge and understanding and a certain amount of wisdom, but there would take certain amount of experience and a certain amount of um, going through life itself for him to accomplish everything God created him to do. He was a human. He was not a celestial being like a third heaven angel. I'm calling it the third heaven angel because here in the body, we've always taught three heavens. You know, uh, your first walk with God in salvation, a second heaven being <clears throat> maturing to a sinless condition like Adam was in the garden. Jesus was in second heaven his whole life, at least after he reached a certain age as a child that God had matured him that far. He never sinned. When he was accountable for sin, he never gave in to it. Uh, he could have. It was, a, it, was, it was possible because he came to this world like, like Adam. He was, he was born of God. He never ceased being born of God. He was just reduced to a seed and placed in Mary's womb, but housed by her human egg, which caused him to be born as a human, born of God. And uh, there was never another man after Adam born of God. We were all born of Adam. So we're all humans, but we're born of Adam's corrupt nature. Adam's nature became corrupt and the world became corrupt. And that's what we have to overcome is our will. That is a corrupt will. Now, you don't have to, you, God wants you to have a will. Jesus had one. He said, my will is to do the will of the one that sent me, my father. So Jesus, he had a will. God doesn't want you to be a robot. And only, we're not serving a God that just wants you to be a uh, to just do what he says, little puppets, you know, he's everything, you know, what he wants, that's what you got to do. That's not, that's not the kind of God we're serving. God wants you to have a will. He wants you to have an individuality. Um, we have stated at times, um, interdependence rather than independence, that we're dependent upon the Lord and one another but God wants you to be you. You've got a, a, a fingerprint. Nobody else has one like it. 
uh, <clears throat> nobody has your testimony. Nobody has your mind. Nobody's got the iris of your eye. No one ever is going to be who you are. God's not making little clones. Uh, God just wants your will to be righteous and fit in, in the righteousness of God's plan. That's that all. God just wants you to learn and have a care, a righteous character. And that's a process. It takes a process to overcome uh, the, the, the sin nature or the Adamic corruptible nature. Uh, <clears throat> but you are human. And uh, you can you can be perfect. You can be a perfect in as a human, uh, but you can take on you know you can become celestial in your even in your body. Bride members uh, will be celestial. They will rule and reign as the angels are. Jesus said, "There as the angels are in heaven, they neither die. Angels neither don't die, and neither will you if you uh, make uh, inherit eternal life." <laughs> Anyway, so uh, I just wanted to say that because I don't want anybody to think that God don't want you, you know, that you just think God just wants to be a big boss that tells everybody exactly what to do. No, that's not how God is. God loves life and he loves all of the different facets of all that, what he gave man. We're made up of so many different um, uh different facets and makeups of our own character and different talents um, that uh, just in, uh, it just enhances the creation of God and, and his greatness, that it's shed, his, his greatness is shed abroad in all of us. That's why we need each other. We need interdependence because I need what you've got that I don't have, but you need what I have too. We need each other. So <clears throat> having said all that, let's go to 2 Peter. If you haven't found it, you're probably not going to find it by now. Excuse me, but my coffee will get cold if I don't drink it, and I need it. So I need it to perk me up a little bit. <clears throat> so forgive me for taking a sip of coffee once in a while. Okay, the seven steps of perfection. Verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. One of the things I want you to remember is this is a divine order of God in the New Testament church 2,000 years ago. Uh, Peter is writing to Paul's churches. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll explain that to you later, but I can prove to you in scripture that he is, he's writing Gentile churches. Now, uh, it's true that there were several Jews in those churches by the time he wrote this because he wrote it right in the very end. And no doubt he was helping the apostle Paul. Matter of fact, Silas, if you read the, the last chapter and uh, you'll see that Silas actually was the scribe or the writer of this for Peter, but Peter was the one that dictated it. Paul was in jail. Paul was in prison. And Paul would have uh, was going to be martyred not too long. And so Peter, he helped carry the burden of these last few years. This was probably written in AD 66, uh, maybe 67 even, just a few years before AD 70, the judgment of God upon Israel. So <clears throat> we're reading about a, uh, an early church that had what we want as a restored church that God's helping us and is restoring. Verse two, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus uh, and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Uh, I'd have to say that he had gave everything. There was a second heaven was available. That's a picture of the holy place in the tabernacle. Um, I'll talk about that later. 
but he had gave all of that to that New Testament church back there from the day of Pentecost until uh, even a, a little bit after AD 70 before it was completely, uh, before it completely fell away. And that's what he's, he's referring to. He said he had called us to glory and virtue, uh, whereby it is given unto us it, uh, exceed whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world through lust. Okay, he says, and beside this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. I want to stop right there. Um, and I want to explain, I want to explain the tabernacle to you because I want to tie these scriptures into the type that is in the tabernacle and its compartments or furniture and compartments and also the restoration of the church that's taking place in the Gentile world. So um, here Peter says, give all diligence. That's, that is one of the things that you and I have got to focus on, that we are diligent and we put forth a diligence uh, to, to grow spiritually. That's why I'm in, in trying to influence you to really read your Bible, not just go through reading it by let, you know, letting it play audibly where you're hearing it or you read it, but you, after you get through reading it, you don't even know what you read. I'm talking about paying attention, focus, and really begin to get a knowledge of the Word of God. That's diligence. Add to your faith virtue. Now, First, you have to have faith. So let me go back through the tabernacle just a minute. The tabernacle, you got in the tabernacle through the gate. You go to the eastern gate. That was the gate on the east side of the tabernacle that you came in. That's where you had to lay your hand on top of a lamb or whatever the sacrifice was and slit its throat before the priest. And then the priest would take it with you in, in the tabernacle and he would, he would burn it on, with fire if it was a burnt sacrifice or if it was uh, a different type of sacrifice, he would put it on, he would burn what had to be burned and cook what had to be cooked. He'd sprinkle its blood around the, around on the horns of the altar and around the base of the altar to sanctify the altar. Um, and then he had to go to the laver, he had to wash himself in the labor, which the labor was lined with women's looking glasses. And uh, so I've already gave you two steps. One's faith. The next one is uh, the brazen altar. The next one is the labor. And that's where the priest went and he washed himself. That, that, that labor was just a big bowl um, sitting on a, on a stand <clears throat> later in the temple of Solomon, it was sitting on the hips or backs of 12 oxen, three oxen facing, let's see if you can see my hand, three oxen facing the North, East, South, and West. I did that backwards, but you get my picture. And the oxen was sitting on, that's a picture of the 12 apostles, the oxen that the labor set on the, the, the ministry, the apostolic ministry back there in the early church. But those, the lining was, I mean, we would call them mirrors today, but back then they were, they were brass plates that were polished. And that's what women, they called them women's looking glasses. Women could look inside that brass shine brass and see themselves. It was like a mirror. James James referred to that in type as the perfect law of liberty. It's the washing of the water of the word 
the, the word of God that was anointed by God's spirit that helped you to see yourself and the correction and judgment in the word of God that God wanted your life to be corrected with and help you on your road to righteousness. So I'm just showing you those compartments. Then the priest had to, from there, after he washed himself, he could see where, you know, what he needed to wash. Then he had to change garments. He had to change from the woolen garment, which represented the flesh, to a white linen garment, which represented righteousness, we're told in the Bible. And so, uh, and he had to do that and that's what prepared him and qualified him to carry the blood of the sacrifice into the holy place. And in the holy place, there was a candlestick that had seven lamps. You know, you've seen it, the, how the two lamps went out this way with a bowl on each end full of olive oil. They were lit with fire, two above that, two above that, and then the main stem was lit above. That's seven lights, and that's none to us is a sevenfold light, which is a perfect light, having a complete understanding. That's what light is. Oil is knowledge, olive oil, and that lamp is knowledge. But when you light it, that's a picture of the anointing of God. No man's ever been able to make fire. Man's always, God's always, God is the only one that can make fire. Man knows how to cause fire to, to start, but what it is and how to make it, um, we, we can't make fire. God did that. Uh, but that lights up. Uh, those seven lights, are, are, that's a sevenfold or a complete light. No lack of understanding. Then also in the holy place was, that's why we call this second heaven, um, that the table of showbread, it had 12 loaves of unleavened bread on it. And that's a picture of the, the, the apostles, the 12 apostles doctrine that had no leaven in it. Leaven is a type of falsehood. That's like yeast that puffs up bread. You know, there's nothing in there, but just air. It's, it, you know, it's, it's just making something look like something that it's not. But leaven, unleavened bread's thin. It don't have any air in it. And, and, uh, but the pure word of God, the pure truth of God with no falsehood with it in it. That's what we're working on today on the restored church. We're working to get a full, a full um, understanding of the uh, truth of the word of God with no, no, no falsehood. And then there was the golden altar where incense had to be offered up. Um, and I'll tell you what that represents here in a little while. It, it represented judgment with the prayers of the saints. And I'll explain that further here in a minute. Thank you. All right. So uh, I want to use that to show you here to, in the fifth, fifth verse that we're to give all diligence to add to your faith. He's talking to people already born again and have faith, but uh, you and I as Gentiles, we have to come in and, and, and we have to receive faith. We have to have faith. Faith uh, uh, is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Paul said, and um, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It takes the anointed word of God and God's touch on your life, on your ears, your mind. It takes God touching you to cause you to have faith that it is God talking to you. That you know that, that, that God has manifested himself to you and that faith has arose in your heart. So <clears throat> faith is the gate that represents that gate of the tabernacle that I told you. That's how you get in the kingdom of heaven. And when you get in, you're in first heaven. You're in the first step, first compartment of heaven. And that's here on earth. It's not up in heaven where God and 
Christ and the heavenly angels are, but that's right here on earth. Uh, Paul, uh, yes, Paul said that, that Jesus Christ has made us to sit together in heavenly places. This is a heaven. The church is a heaven. It's a heavenly place. It has heavenly divine ordinances. It has divine operation in it. The spirit of God works in it. The anointing of God works, of God's word works in it. It's a heaven. It, we're in a heavenly place. It's just not the highest heaven. You know, Paul said uh, in Galatians, it wasn't it when he said, I knew a man above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Such a one was caught up into paradise unto third heaven. Well, if there's a third heaven, there has to be a first and a second. You can't get to third. You can't jump from zero to three. And so uh, I'm showing you what these three heavens are. First heaven is the tabern the outer court and the tabernacle. And so faith is the gate. And when you get in the gate, your next stop is is the brazen altar, and that's the that's where sacrifice is made. And of course, we don't have to come under Moses' law and make physical sacrifices or literal sacrifices anymore, but you do have to give yourself to God wholly. You have to give your life a sacrifice. You have to realize I'm God's child. I am, um, you know, he's the creator. I, I, he created me to fulfill his purpose. If I don't uh, adhere to that, and if I don't hear, listen to my creator or ever recognize him and give him space in my life, then my life will be temporal and I will die and I will miss out on life, on eternal life. Therefore, you know, uh, a, a fool, uh, by, uh, the psalmist said, a fool says in his heart, there's no God. You know, anyone just wants to live on this temporal life and, and they don't want to go any further with it, they don't have much of a vision about life. So, uh, so to add to your faith, virtue, virtue is, is strength. It's, uh, it's moral strength. It's uh, Jesus, when, when a, the little woman with an issue of blood crawled, pressed through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment, he turned around and said, I felt virtue go out of me. He felt the power of God go out of him and touch someone. That's virtue. Virtue is a strength that in our sight, you see, you give strength to your faith by being obedient and offering your life up to God, recognizing I can't just live by faith. By the way, Martin Luther is the one that restored faith. The, the reformer that God used to restore faith, that was his main message was the just shall live by faith. He turned men from understanding religious rituals and thinking that saying so many our fathers or Hail Marys would get your sins forgiven or paying some penance, but it took a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through faith. And, and Martin Luther restored that. Now, John and Charles Wesley, we would have to give them uh, credit for restoring sanctification, that you can't just have faith, but you have got to be obedient. That obedience, being obedient to be baptized in water, being obedient to, to repent of your sins, to humble yourself, that gives power to your faith. It shows that I believe in the word of God and I believe I see that I'm in need of God and I see I need to humble myself before him. I need to repent of my uh, sinful condition and, and uh, uh, I need his help. I need God's strength. I need to know more of him. That's what the brazen altar represents and what was restored in those two things was the Protestant movement. God began the restoration period with Protestantism. 
Martin Luther and John and Charles Wesley. And of course, there were many others added uh, a, along the way in the Restoration, but those were the main fun those were the main principles of Protestantism. Uh, uh, then he says, add to your virtue, knowledge, temperance, and to, and he says, add virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temper, temperance, patience. I'm giving you all three of those because they all fit in the labor. That's your next step. See, you first have to have faith. You have to believe in Jesus. You have to believe in the salvation plan. You have to go to the brazen altar and you have to repent of your sins, be baptized in water and uh, humble yourself before God. And then the next step is the labor. Some people were never able to leave Protestantism. They stayed there. They, everyone didn't move in every move of rest, restoring the church that God brought about. But the next move was Pentecost, the Pentecostal era, and that is the labor. That's rest, that is represented in the labor. That's the type. Brother William Souders always taught that the labor was the Pentecostal era. And I'll add that Brother William Souders is uh, calling and the work that he did for God uh, with the gift God gave him was the very center of the Pentecostal era. That's what God brought out of the Pentecostal era was uh, the body of Jesus Christ, the message of the body, understanding the restoration, the falling away and the restoration of the church and where we're at in God's time and and all, and here's what happened. This is where after the baptism of the Holy Ghost began to come upon God's people that would receive it, those people began to get knowledge. That's where we didn't just have superficial knowledge, but God began to break the word down for us through many threshing floors of many meetings at the campground and different places that the body of Christ has had that has given us knowledge. But knowledge by itself uh, is, is, it will, you know, it's not understanding. And there's where temperance comes. Temperance is for us to be tempered. The way you temper uh, metal or steel is to, to put it through severe heat and then cool it down. Severe heat and cool it down that strengthens steel. Well, for us to be tempered in our knowledge, it will produce understanding because when you go through the temperance, when, when you go through trials and tests and apply the knowledge of the word of God, it tempers God's word and causes you to understand that knowledge and what it how what it really adds to your life and uh as far as the big picture of god god's overall plan see just knowledge itself won't do the job but it takes it takes understanding um then um add to temperance patience now that that word patience means if you look it up in the strong's or the Greek, it means endurance, enduring or continuance. See, you not only uh, have to gain knowledge, and I'm talking about a, the knowledge of the anointed word, to really get a knowledge of God's anointed word, and then to be tempered to a place that it, it's, it's become a part of your understanding that knowledge has opened up to become a part of your thinking, of your mindset, your character. And then patience to, to endure. See, you can't just stop along the way, but you've got to endure and continue uh, and, and be patient. Let God lead you. We've always said it's just as dangerous 
one step ahead of God as it is one step behind him. And so we have to be, we have to continue and be led by the spirit of God. And that's part of that, the work of the labor being washed by the water of the word, that water spirit and the word is the word of God. They that worship God, worship him, God must worship him in spirit and truth. You've got to have the, the spirit of God. The word of God is just words without the spirit of God and anointing to, to touch that word and cause you to know, have an intimate knowing of the word of God and begin to get the understanding and be tempered in that. And then to learn to continue, it becomes a part of you that you walk in that and being led by the spirit of God and that's the operation of the labor. And that's another step. You know, if you if you don't have a real clear knowledge and, and God's not tempered you and took you through many things and experiences in life and, and saw you through your trials and tests and temptations, and if you've not continued with God, then you are you haven't made that. What step is that? Faith, virtue knowledge. You may have some knowledge, but are you tempered yet? See, that's the fourth step. Then the fifth step is patience. All right. And then to patience, godliness. Now that, that is, that's the sixth step. And there's where the priest had to change garments. And that's the garment change. And, and that white linen garment stands for righteousness. That's, that's a picture of the brides dressed in white, uh, that white uh, uh, linen garment represents the righteousness of God. And that's the clothes. We're taking off this, the fleshly, corruptible fleshly uh, uh, aspect of, of us, of our being, and we're putting on the righteousness of Christ. It's becoming a part of our character. And <clears throat> so uh, I had someone, I taught this lesson last night to Brother ZZ in Miami, Florida's people. And I just thought since it's fresh on my mind, I'd go over it again. I get a little more out of it every time I talk about it. And um, so, um, uh, here, uh, to add to our patience, godliness, that's God likeness. See, when you begin to put on right righteousness, and this is what gets us in a place where we are, have the power to live above sin. We become God like we're, we're becoming like him. We think like him. See, that's what makes you, you can have a, ter you can have an enemy. You can have a crawl, you know, in your, you can have something in your crawl against your enemies. It's very hard to, to obey the scriptures that said, love them that hate you. <laughs> you know, do, bless them. Do, do, <laughs> you know, it's hard to do that until you get more like God. But when you get like Jesus Christ, you'll pity someone that is your enemy and treats you wrong because you'll just know that's sin in their life that, and you'll pity that, that they've not been able to grow beyond that, and that they've got that in, that corruption in their spirit and in their thinking. And you'll, you'll, you know, you can't, you can't accept fellowship with it, but you can pity it and pray for it. And uh, you can want your enemies. You, you can want your enemies to be saved. You can love your enemies, but you can't love the sin that's in them or the corruption that's in them. Uh, but when you think like God, see God, he, he, you know, when you, I, hey, when I go back and think about my life when I was a younger man, young boy, I mean, I, I wasn't worthy of anything God did for me. But do you know what? Every time I turned to God from my evil ways, he was right there. Jesus was right there to touch me, to bless me, to love me to let me have an experience with him in the spirit. Uh, that's how precious he is. That's how, how much love God has 
uh, he's got, he's, he's, um, uh, we're just serving a precious God that's full of love, but his love, it's not a, a condoning love that condones anything. That's not true love. True love will correct you and want you to get things out of your life that's hindering you and hindering everybody else around you. So to put on this white linen garment, that makes us God-like. So add to your patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness. That's number seven. That's step number seven. Uh, that's filial love. That's not true charity. That's the next one. But brotherly kindness is Philadelphia. Filial love. love brotherly kindness. And if you love not your brother whom you have seen, how are you going to love God whom you've not seen? John said. It, we, we've got to get to a place where we are like the scripture says, Savior shall rise up on thee, Mount Zion. We've got to grow to a place where we become saviors, like Jesus Christ, not that we'll ever have his position or ever have to do the work on the cross that he did. That was done once and for all. But we have, if we can have the spirit and the character and righteousness of Christ when he was here on this earth, we, we can love our brothers in the Lord. We may not agree with them. They may not be in step in this step seven I'm telling you about. They may be in step one or two, but you can love the process they're going through and you can understand why they're not as mature as you, you would want to see them be, but you can know they're on the road. If you can help and encourage them to stay on the road, stay in the boat, <laughs> Well, then you'll know, you'll be glad. You'll, you'll, you, you, we all have to have brotherly kindness. I've told the church here, I said, what that really means, just jokingly, I said, what it means is, is that if you've got a hundred dollar bill, you give me half of it. If you're my brother, if you're really my brother, you'd give me half of it. And when you get charity, you, you'll give me the whole hundred. <laughs> I've always uh, in a joking way, said that to the church to get them to understand what I'm saying. That when you have brotherly kindness, you don't have, you don't fully have charity yet. There's another step in that. And the next step is a holy place. And that's where you're going to get the love of God. That's what charity is. It is the undeniable, absolute love of God. That, was in G that is in Jesus Christ, his son also, and that he wants us to develop into that place and that second heaven. That's this paradise. I had somebody ask me last night, they said, Brother Smith, I thought second heaven's when we, when we got the Holy Ghost. You're saying we got the Holy Ghost in first heaven and the labor. I sure am. That is, that is fictitious to say you're in second heaven when you get the Holy Ghost. That takes place in the labor. That's an operation of the Spirit of God in the labor with the Word of God the, and, and the, the washing of the water uh, of the Word. It takes place there. I'll help you understand it a little better, better by asking you this question. If you got in second heaven when you got the Holy Ghost, why don't you have a sevenfold light? that's in the holy place? Or why don't you have the unleavened bread, that there's no falsehood, that you've got a complete knowledge and understanding of God's unadulterated word of God and a complete sevenfold light and understanding concerning everything in heaven. So you know you don't have that. We know we're still in a restoration period and we haven't got there yet. Uh, you know, but, but it's coming where we, you know, and uh, just because, let me state this, just because second heaven is available, it was in the early church, it will be available down here in uh, the restored church. Just, let's go back to the early church, better to understand, just because it was available didn't mean everybody was in second heaven. 
you still have to go through the process. New people came in the early church. They came in through faith. They had to add virtue to their faith. They had to add knowledge, temperance, and patience. And by the way, I'm giving all this in, you know, about 40 minute lesson and it, this, you can't even do this. If, if, if the church is restored, you could do it in the 40 year period. You could do it even a lot earlier than that. The apostle, uh, the apostle, um, uh, James, he was martyred. And uh, they, they think about AD 44, which had only been 11 years after the day of Pentecost, or it could have even been a little earlier, a little bit earlier than that. So, uh, you, you know, God, God can take you wherever He wants to take you when it's all available. But <clears throat> just because it was available didn't mean any, everybody was in it. There was lots of people in first heaven. The Gentiles that came in, they were in first heaven. A lot of the Jews that come in. Depend on when they come in, depend on how much they focus, depend on how much diligence they had, that they would uh, add, begin to understand these things. It takes time to even understand it. It takes time, Peter said, to uh, that after you've suffered a while, after you've suffered with, with the people of God and suffered yourself to bring yourself into subjection to the plan of God, uh, that, that the Lord make you perfect, uh, strengthen and settle you. Well, I, I, I use it this way, that God first has to settle you. It takes time just to get settled down in here. I was talking to a brother today in our church that he's really starting to get settled. He's really getting to a place that he wants the knowledge of the word of God. He wants to get all of this in his heart and in his life. It's to, it takes time. It depends on how you was raised, what kind of environment you came out of, many different things. Um, so, uh, no, there's eight steps to perfection. I'm talking right now uh, on the seventh step. The eighth step is charity. That eight is, a, it, you know, circumcision had to be done on the eighth day. That eight, the eighth day is a new day. That starts everything new. And so seven, we, we get to a completeness where uh, perfection, I mean, in the garment change, that's where God begins to require us to live above sin. We have the power to live above sin. Like for an example, Adam in the garden, when Adam sinned, God put up two cherubims and a flaming sword in every direction, turning every direction. And he said, now least man put forth his hand. And he put those two cherubims and that, that flaming sword there at the east end of the garden, picture of the tabernacle going into the holy place. That's what the garden's a picture of. And and that's where life eternal is. Said, now at least man put forth his hand. He put those two cherubims and that flaming sword to keep the way of the tree of life. He said, now at least man put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live forever. It's in the Genesis uh, 1, I believe verse 10 maybe. Anyway, you can check that out. Um, so now here we are in... Uh, uh, in the holy place. And here is, that's where the church will be fully restored. And that's where we're in the garden of Eden. And we're going to put forth our hands and eat of the tree of life and live forever. Joel, the second chapter said that he prophesied, of the, Peter said, this is that spoken of by the prophet of Joel on the day of Pentecost. And he said, uh, Joel did, he said, Here's what's coming. A people that there's never been a people like them ever in the whole wide world, and there never will be for many generations. And that's us. After many gen the early church was that people that there's never been nobody like, because Joel was prophesying of the New Testament church. But that church fell away, and when it's restored, there'll be another people like that people. And here's what he said about it. He said, uh, the Garden of Eden, 
is before them in a desolate wilderness behind them. They was headed back into the garden, passing through the cherubims. Those two cherubims represent God and Christ. It represents the covenants of God that he put in Christ, the Old and New Testament. He was called the word of God. We've got to pass through the plan of God that's in them covenants and the word of God that's in there that turns in every direction that will judge us for every deed that we commit. And so God's going through our whole life and working on everything in us. And that's why it takes steps, progressive steps of maturity to reach perfection or our full age. See, Paul said in Ephesians 4, until we come to the fullness of the stature of the man, Christ Jesus, that we be no more tossed to and fro by the wind of uh, doctrine, men's doctrine whereby they lie in wait. See, God, God, he, he, he's got a plan that will redeem man, fully redeem us to life, life eternal. The, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal. Hallelujah. And so in the holy place, there's a sevenfold life. There's a table of showbread and there is a altar, golden altar of incense the priest had to take coals off the altar. She had to take blood and sanctify every compartment uh, for him to sanctify and offer up that blood in the holy place for the high priest to carry it in once a year and to get sins forgiven for everyone every year. But, but that golden altar, coals from the brazen altar had to be carried in there and a special mixture of incense it had to be exactly, and that's, we got to do this exactly the in the pattern that God gives us to do it and the order he wants us to do it. You can't skip around, do what you want to do. You got to go through the process. But when those, when that incense is offered up in the holy place, uh, it says in the eighth chapter of the book of Revelations, let me go there right quick. We're going to end this up. Uh, eighth chapter of Revelations and the third verse. And this is, this is the first trumpet getting ready to sound, but listen to it. It said, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand and the angel took a censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it into the earth. There were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. That was judgment. And it was with the prayers of the saints. See, in other words, when Jesus, when he uh, blew a trumpet, when he came to this world, he judged, he brought judgment. He cast judgment into this earth. He destroyed the devil. He destroyed evil. He destroyed uh, the works of evil that was in man by judgment. He burned up all grass, the Bible says. He, and uh, so, and it was with the prayers of the saints. See, see because a savior, uh, he not only judges, but he also is a mediator carrying to God our prayers. And what are our prayers? Our prayers is everything about the situation of life that we're going through. God, help me in everything that I'm doing. Help me to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm praying to you. I'm asking you to work in my life and every facet of my life to help me get through with what you want me to achieve and the overcoming, grant me the overcoming power and the knowledge and the temperance and the patience or endurance to continue in your purpose and your plan and your calling until I achieve the place that you call me to arrive and that's second heaven perfection. And if I reach there, I'm going to be in the bride of Jesus Christ and inherit third heaven and rule and reign with my Savior for a thousand years. Hallelujah. 
So I just want to encourage you tonight with these eight steps of perfection. Let's see if we can, uh, let's see if we can uh, go back to, uh, I'm going to go back to Second Peter because I want to read this and I'm going to close right here. I want to go back to the eighth verse after it says, add to brotherly kindness, charity, for if these things be in you, listen to this, and abound. I mean, you really got it. It's really becoming a part. They make you that you shall never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Did, did you know you could forget? Verse 10, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You want to make sure that you're going to make it? I'll just give you the eight steps to do it. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. You'll never fall. My God in heaven, God's given us a, a great message and a great hope knowing that if we follow, these things that were given us, that we be partakers of these great riches, we'll be partakers of the divine nature. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God. All right, I hope you... Uh, uh, appreciate all of you coming. It's always a, it's it's always humbling uh, to talk to God's people or to think that you have something that they need. I know that myself within me, I don't, but I know with what God has done in my life and equipped me with a gift of the ministry. I know that it's for God's people, and I I, I have to be obedient to give forth what God gave me to give. And so, but I want to thank you for being attentive and coming to our, these meetings. And and um, uh, I, it, uh, the, this is a great tool that we have found to use since this pandemic. I never ever did one of these broadcasts before. I never did um, a. I never did the Zoom meetings that we're doing now in the Dominican Republic every Monday night along with uh, others in other countries. I see Brother uh, brother Fidel is on here tonight with from Guatemala. He's always faithful in every, everything we do. He's, he's a hungry man for the things of God. Then um, uh, I didn't know about Facebook broadcasts. I didn't know about Zoom. Last night I had a Bible study with Brother ZZ and his people in Miami, Florida, and that was on uh, some kind of a, I don't remember what it's even called. It seemed like it's called Smart Call or something like that. It's just like Zoom, except you don't see each other. It's it's on, It's all, everybody's on the phone. I mean, you have a hundred people on the same phone. They're, they're, they can unmic or, or mute their mics. They can talk, they can ask questions. Brother ZZ interpreted everything I said into Creole. They read in French. Uh, you know, it's just like a Zoom meeting. We just couldn't see each other. And that was somewhat fortunate because I didn't have to put on a suit and tie. They didn't know I had on my pajama bottoms. <laughs> it was eight o'clock last night when we did it. So anyway, I shouldn't have told y'all that. I I am dressed for church. Um uh, uh, sitting here, and uh, I do think that the men of God, I think that when we present ourselves to God's people as ministers, we are, I think the way you dress has a matter. I think it has influence. I think we are to look like the prestige, uh, have prestige. Uh, we are to dress the part of the office that we're holding, and uh, we shouldn't be too casual about it. And so I'm not far, you know, going to church with uh, casual clothes on, not as a minister of God. In fact, I think everybody 
it's God's house. We ought to honor God enough to, uh, you know, dress uh, in a certain way. So I always try, and I've asked the men in the Dominican Republic to do the same. I said, when you get on these Zoom meetings, I want you to have a shirt and tie on. I don't want you to look like, you know, just some everyday guy walked in off the street. Now, sometimes men get off of work. They just barely can even get on. I excuse that, and I understand that, and there are exceptions to every rule. But for the most part, I used to have an old pastor, and his name was C.T., Cecil Gray, 105 South Sadie in San Antonio, Texas. I was his assistant pastor. He mowed his grass in a suit. <laughs> he, I mean, he'd pull his coat off most of the time, but he still had on a white shirt and a tie. Uh, he did wear... Uh, he did wear pastel shirts from time to time, like pastel blue, pastel green, or yellow, or something like that. But he all, I don't know if I ever seen him without a certain tie on. I guess the only time he took it off is when he went to bed, and he must have put it on first thing when he got up, because that's the way I always saw him. He was a precious brother. He's not alive anymore, but I loved him, and he, he did a lot for me, uh, he was a, a father in the Lord to me, and I appreciate him very much. Anyway, God bless your hearts. Uh, have a good evening. Uh, remember to continue to pay, pray for Rick Jolly, and ja the pastor in Jasper, Texas. It looks like he's going to have to have a lung transplant after having COVID. He, the, his lungs are too damaged for him to live without a lung transplant unless God gives him a miracle, and he can. So let's keep him in our prayer list. Also, Brother Majesty and Brother Yvonne George's church down in Naples, Florida, the pastor of the church in Naples, had a severe heart attack three weeks ago. He is still unconscious. He's had heart surgery, but they're not getting enough oxygen to his brain, and they don't know what state he's in or if he's going to be, even be able to come back. Uh, you know, if you would pray for Brother Majesty, his church, his wife, Brother George's, that's one of his main right-hand men. So <clears throat> pray for that situation, Brother Majesty. He's a precious brother, faithful in the body of Christ. Uh, my daughter-in-law, Cindy, Michael Smith's wife, Cindy Smith, her mother, Sister Angie Elder, is uh, living in, uh, I mean, she's right now staying with Michael and Cindy, Pray for her. She's having health issues and pray that God would touch her. And, uh, you know, I think she's up in her early 80s, but I'm in my early 70s. So I'm praying for her because I, when I get to where she's at, I want to I want to I want to be healthy and I want her to be healthy. And I'd like for her to be healthy to however long God let her live and then when it is time for God to take her, just let her go down, lay down and go to sleep. She don't have to be sick enough to die. She can, God can just take her home when he gets ready. <laughs> so let's pray for Sister Elder. Also pray for Sister Crow. She's 95 in our church and she's waning in her health, but she's asking us to pray. She would like to uh, be able to, you know, for God to touch her and help her enough that life wasn't so difficult that it wasn't hardly worth living. She loves church and she loves the people of God. So pray for Sister Crow. Brother and Sister Weaver, Ray Weaver, their house burnt. <clears throat> we were so thankful that it only destroyed the bathroom and the hallway, but smoke damage throughout the house. And we're trying to get that house back into a livable condition for them. If you would help us pray for that. See, that's all part of God's prayers. It's offered up in the holy place. Right now, our, our moderator, I mean, our mediator, Jesus, is doing that for us. But it'll sure be nice when there's a second heaven condition and there's righteous men of God and women of God that are working in there that is saviors have rose up on the Mount Zion and, and begin to help the Lord carry this load. Finally, they'll help him run, run, rule and reign a thousand years. So God bless your hearts. It's good to have talked to you. It's 813. Y'all didn't get on here till a little bit late, so I'm not, I ain't holding you much overtime. <laughs> God bless your hearts. Remember what I always tell you. Please pray for me and I will pray for you.
God bless your hearts. Have a good night. I'll see the local people in Little Rock in church. We're having regular breakfast at 930 on Sunday mornings, Bible study at 10, band practice at uh, 11, worship service upstairs in the sanctuary at 1130.